That's the first plaintiff, Orion Gallagher. Orion Gallagher was eight months old when he suffered acute liver failure. I'm going to get into it in a minute. Next one's Kathy Ryerson. That's Kathy on the right. She's the one that died. Next one, please. And that's Yvonne Arnone. Uh, she lives in Summerlin. Ready, Gar? Yeah, we're ready. All rise to the screen. Just good evening. You can put me on the screen, please. All right, do the party stipulate the presence of the group? Yes, Your Honor. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Mr. Rasmussen, here. Yes, uh, just wanted to make sure the court was aware. Uh, Michael McCree is here from Penn Instruments uh, because during board I there was limited seating. Uh, he was not in the courtroom until uh, today, or so we had to do what we needed to do. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. All right. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, taken a while to get to where we're at right now, but I have a few remarks I have to make as we get started. And um, I just want to let you know that I have, I will have a discussion with you regarding basically the procedure that will be involved as far as the case is concerned, because I want to make sure, sure you understand what's going on. And uh, also remember this, and I always focus on this from the very outset of the case, uh, whatever I say right now as far as the introduction to the, the specific case, uh, it shall not be construed as a substitute for the detailed instructions I will give you at the close of the case, you understand? Uh, and I think it's important to point out because I will make some comments on uh, certain key points. Now understand this, um, uh, as far as what I'm going to do, uh, I, I have no, no uh, discussion regarding what the lawyers are going to do. This is somewhat of a different point, it, it really it truly is. Because I think it's important for you to understand how we got here, right? And I, I know you understand how we got here from a jury selection perspective, but also how we got here as far as this case is concerned. And uh, this is a civil lawsuit, and the plaintiff filed a complaint, and an answer was on, filed on behalf of all the defendants in this case. Uh, so you understand this. And um, uh, each party has the burden of proving their respective claims and or defenses by preponderance of the evidence. Now, there is a uh, claim for punitive damages, and that will be by a standard called clear and convincing evidence. Now, remember this, and this is important to point out. As far as all standards are concerned, you'll be given detailed instructions on those issues. You understand? Yeah. Uh, uh, next up, uh, you need to know how the case will proceed in order. And so, uh, as far as this case is concerned, at this point, each party is entitled to give an opening statement, right? Now understand, an opening statement is not evidence. It's not. Uh, the statements simply serve to, to serve the purpose of an introduction to the case and what the anticipated evidence will be. Understand? Look at it like a roadmap. Or look at it like, uh, I guess, uh, whatever you might have in your car, you know, as far as uh, the maps and things like that. And so they're going to give you an idea as to what they think the evidence will show. Uh, plaintiff will, of course, go first because they have the initial burden of proof. You understand that? And um, what they will do is, after opening statements, uh, they will present what's called the plaintiff's case in chief. And, and understand this, throughout this whole proceeding so far, you haven't heard from witnesses yet, right? That's when you start hearing from witnesses and you start hearing testimony. You understand? Just want to make sure you know how we're going. Um, <clears throat> similarly, after the plaintiff closes their case in chief, the defense will be given an opportunity to do, to do the same. And they will call witnesses. And uh, that's when we'll hear testimony again. And you'll probably, from both sides, from the plaintiff's perspective and from the defense perspective, you'll probably hear from the individual plaintiffs in this case. Uh, you'll probably hear from expert witnesses of various different types. It's the same from the defense. You might hear from a client representative and so on. And that's kind of how, and that's the evidentiary portion of the case. 
understand this, that it's not until we've heard all of the evidence in the case, and it's not until that point that I will uh, instruct you on what the law is, right? We've talked about that a little bit. And, uh, Here's an instruction I give in every case. I just want to remind you, and it really and truly, and this one will be given. And it's jury instruction number one, and I just want to remind you what your duties and responsibilities are. And I know you know this, but I just want to make sure the record's clear. Because remember, it's my duty as a judge to instruct you in the law. That applies to this case. I know you got that. I do. And it is your duty to follow these instructions and apply the rules of law to the facts as you find from the evidence. Because that's your determination, right? I give you the law, you determine what the facts are. I don't. Everybody understand? Okay. As far as the instructions are concerned, when we give them, and I understand you get this because I spend a lot of time with jury instructions. But you're not to be concerned with the wisdom of any rule of law as stated in the instructions I'll give you later on, right, at the close of the evidence. Um, and and here, here is what's important to remember about that is you might say, well, Judge, why can't you give the instructions now? Well, I can't do that until I know what all the evidence is, right? And it depends on what type of rulings they make during the course of the trial. And so uh, you can look at it from this perspective. It's probably a good, good metaphor. Um, it's like when you uh, cook a dish. You can't determine what dish you're going to cook until you have all the ingredients, right? It's kind of like the same thing. You have to have all the workings that it takes uh, in that regard. Uh, and sort of look at it from that perspective. And remember, regardless of any opinion as you may have as to what the law ought to be, it would be a violation of your oath to base a verdict on any other view of the law than that's given in the instructions I give you, right? And everybody understands it. I know you do. And that's one of the reasons why I spend a lot of time on it. Uh, so think about that for a second. Now, after the instructions on the law are read, to you, each party is given an opportunity to conduct what's called closing argument. Now, here's what's different about closing argument versus opening statement. Because an opening statement, look at it as like a road map or a guideline, or you're um, following your iPhone as far as directions and the, and the types of things you can do with, the, with all our technology, right? Uh, in contrast, the closing argument is much different. It really and truly is because at that time, you have you will have had an opportunity to listen to all the evidence, right? All the witnesses testify, and uh, you will have had a chance to um, listen to them, make a decision as to what facts you believe or don't believe, or whatever it might be. But you have, will have listened to all the facts and all the testimony. Uh, but just as important at that point after we do that, remember this too, before you deliberate, you don't know what the law is, right? And that we give given to you to take and utilize during your deliberation process. Everybody understand that? That's kind of how, how that goes. Um, now, remember what your purpose is, right? And that's important to remember. We sometimes overlook that. But... Um, and I've talked about it, but I'd always like to come back and say it again. It's your purpose as jurors to find and determine the facts. That's what it is. Now, there's different ways to determine facts, but that's ultimately up to you. It really and truly is. Um, you can determine the facts from the testimony you hear and other evidence, including the exhibits that have been entered into evidence, right? Um, it is up to you to determine the inferences which you feel may be properly drawn from the evidence, right? That's up to you. That's your decision. It is especially important that you perform your duty of determining the facts diligently and conscientiously. Because, understand this, once you make a decision, it stands for the most part. It really does. 
So it's important for you to listen to all the facts and follow the rules of law that I give you in the instructions. Because like most civil cases, these cases take a long time to get to this position. And just as important too, you see the efforts it's taken just from the jury selection process, right? It's not like law and order. Remember we talked about that, right? It's not, it's a different process. <clears throat> now this is important too. Uh, the parties may sometimes present objections to some of the testing. They object, right? And, uh, it's the, and, and understand this, uh, you have to look at it through this lens. It's the lawyer's duty and responsibility to their clients at certain times to object, right? It is. That's doing their job. But just because you're objecting, don't hold that against them, right? And look at it from that perspective. Lawyers are lawyers, and, and they will do their job. But this is just as important, too. Remember um, what my role is as a trial judge, right? Sometimes I have to overrule objections. Sometimes I sustain objections. But whatever decision I make, whatever I might say, you can't use in any way as some sort of inference that the judge is favoring one party over the other. I'm not. You can look at it from this perspective, too. It's like, uh, I know many of you have watched baseball on some level, right? Some have, have participated. But what's the role of the umpire? call balls and strikes. That's all I'm here for. You understand? So, just, so you can sit back and count and say, well, the judge has stained one side more times over the other side. He must think that this side wins. That's not true. I just look at each pitch as it's thrown across the plate. You understand? That's my role. I'm here to be neutral and call balls and strikes. One other point, too. Remember, Anything you may have seen or heard outside of this courtroom is not evidence and must be disregarded, right? Remember I talked about it and I'd emphasize this from the very first time we met when it comes to social media and I think, did I say uh, conducting research with Dr. Google? You can't do that, right? We talked about that. Because in this case, you'll hear witnesses testify. Uh, some will be professional, some will be highly educated. Uh, and so it's your job that, to sit back as members of this jury collectively and evaluate that evidence and evaluate their testimony. And it's up to you to decide which side to believe in or not to believe. You understand? That's your law. But you're not to go to any other sources other than what you see here in this court. Everybody understand? Uh, also, it, it's important to remember, too, <coughs> That statements, arguments, and opinions of counsel are not evidence, right? That comes from the witness stand. And the witness stand is right here in front of you. Everybody understand? Now, sometimes we do have what's called stipulations. And look at that as simply an, agree an agreement. Because sometimes lawyers will agree to certain facts. And if they agree, you accept that. And don't question it, you understand? Because they agree, you know. It would be like a bad, and this never happens, but it would, it would be like someone stepping up the plate and saying, yeah, I'll agree the first pitch is a strike. They accept it, right? And that's all I want to point out when you hear stipulation. That's what it means. Now, this is, this is an important issue, too. Um, understand there's two types of evidence that you will probably hear, hear in this case. And you have direct evidence, and you have circumstantial evidence. And under the law, you're, you can give equal weight to each, each one. Now, uh, you might look at me and say, well, Judge, what's the difference? But you know the difference. You, you, you actually make decisions based upon direct and circumstantial evidence every day. And, and I'll give you a really classic example. Uh, you get up in the morning, you look outside, and, it, and it's raining. And what conclusion do you come to? It's been raining probably all night, right? We've all done that. But sometimes, don't you get up in the morning, and you look out the window, and you look down on the ground, and water's everywhere, right? You didn't see it rain, but we know what happened, right? It rained last night. And that's circumstantial evidence, you understand? 
versus direct evidence would be watching you. But you, under the law, you get equal weight to vote. But ultimately, it's, it's up to you to decide what impact or evaluation you give to either form of evidence. That's your decision as ladies and gentlemen and members of this jury. Understand? That's your sole role. Now, when it comes to um, considering the weight and value of testimony of each witness, that's up to you, right? But I'm just going to remind you, you may take, and this is what we do every day. I'm kind of reminding you when you talk to people, you judge them from time to time, right? We just do naturally. And what do you do? You take into consideration when you're talking to someone, their appearance, you may take into consideration attitude or behavior, right? As a witness. That's what you do as members of the jury. It's kind of up to you to do that. Um, also, the interest of the witness and the outcome of the case, if any, relationships and so on. But that's up to you to decide, right? Because you're ultimately the fact finder as far as this is concerned. And, the, and as a result, uh, you may give the testimony of any witness such weight and value as you believe the testimony of that specific witness is entitled. That's your decision. Understand that. Now, as far as this trial is concerned, and, and we're going to get to one important point that I really want to focus on. Remember, what's the purpose of a jury trial? It's the search for the truth. That's what it is. <coughs> and it's up to you to make those decisions. Now, under our system of justice, and this is uh, slightly different because I don't think this is uh, applicable in all jurisdictions or all states. In Nevada, jurors can ask questions, right? They can do that. But there are limitations as far as asking questions because, number one, when you ask a question, the question isn't necessarily for me. The question is not for the lawyers. The question is for the witnesses who are testifying on the stand. Do you understand? Everybody get it. And, and, and this is what's important to remember about that because if you have a question for a witness testifying, uh, we have a procedure in place as how do we handle that. Now the first caveat I have to give you is this as far as asking questions of a witness. It has to be while the witness is on the stand. You understand that? Very important because once they leave, we don't call them back. That's just kind of how that works. But when a witness is testifying on the stand, you're given an opportunity to ask that specific witness questions. Now there's a form we do, we do that in, and you have your evidentiary notebooks, and what you do is essentially this. You take and write your question down. You identify yourself with name, last name, and badge number. Uh, you write it up, and you raise your hand. And then, remember, this has to be why the witness is testifying, right? And then, then when you raise your hand, that'll be a cue for the marshal. He'll come and give that question at the appropriate time, and then he'll bring it to me, and, and I'll have counsel uh, come sidebar and discuss the question. Now, probably, I'd say 75, maybe 80, maybe 65% of the time, depending on the case, uh, I accept the question. And I will ask the witness that question, right? But remember this, and this is important to remember, and you can look at it from this perspective. Not every question a lawyer might have of a witness is, is permissible, right? Because lawyers object, right? That's, that's part of the process. And uh, I can <coughs> sustain the objection or overrule. Now it's kind of it's not quite the exact same thing, but sometimes we have panel members or members of the jury who they'll ask a question. And remember this, I have to review those questions for counsel. Sometimes they're very relevant, sometimes for whatever reason, based upon the evidence or some rule, I can't ask that question. Right? Here's my point. If you, have a, if you have a question and it doesn't get asked for whatever reason after discussion with counsel, please don't, don't let that preclude you from asking more questions if you feel the need to do so. You understand? Everybody get that. Because not all questions get asked. But, but most do. So you promise me you won't let that stop you. Right? Because it's not personal. Because I just look at it from this perspective, just like a question a lawyer might have of a witness. And there's reasons why 
I just can't tell you at the time why I didn't ask a question. But understand that it was, it's nothing personal about the question. There might be a reason in the law as to why the question can't be asked. Get ready to <coughs> But have, so have confidence in that regard. And uh, just remember, you know, as far as the question should be, be, the focus should be on, you know, factual issues, information. For example, if an uh, expert has an opinion on something, maybe you want to know, may have explained it better. But you might know, well, how did he come to that conclusion? Or well, why didn't you consider this? You know, those types of things, right? Um, but um, sometimes, and this is the, if you can look at it from this perspective, Sometimes questions simply are not allowed. That might be the type you're asking at that point under the rules of evidence. And typically, that would be the reason why I wouldn't do it. Um, this is important from my perspective, and understand this. And I think I hit it on a little earlier. No statement, ruling, remark, or comment uh, that I make during the course of the trial is in any way intended to indicate my opinion as to how you should decide this case. Everybody understand? That's up to you. Not up to me. I will tell you what the law is, right? I will tell you, and you promised to follow the law a couple of times, right? And I'll tell you what that is. But when it comes to the facts, you're the judge, right? And it's true. You're the judges of the facts. Now remember this too, it's important that you keep an open mind and not decide any issue in the case until the entire case has been submitted to you, understand that? And it makes perfect sense because you really can't decide the ultimate outcome until you get the instructions to know what the law is. Now with your notebooks, feel free to take down whatever facts you want to take down. No one will have access to it, it'll be confidential, right Mr. Marshall? That's correct. It'll be locked up, right? And so uh, if you're a copious note taker, have at it, right? Do what you do. Now here's important too, because what I don't want you to do during the course of this trial is take any sort of, uh, anything I may say or do, have any inferences to who wins and who loses, right? It's not meant to be that way at all, right? And here's my point. Sometimes, especially when certain experts testify, I might take notes. Right? Now, that me taking notes means nothing from your perspective. Sometimes I'm just taking notes because I want to make sure uh, I understand what the witness is testifying to and whether there's a proper evidentiary basis for his testimony. That's all. Again, in case there's an objection, I can respond. Many times I don't take notes, but sometimes I do. But understand this, if I take a, a note, uh, take a note as to a particular witness, that doesn't mean I think his testimony is. It's, it has greater influence or lesser influence. I'm just kind of doing part of what I do as a trial judge. Everybody understand? Means nothing to you. <clears throat> now here's another important point, and we'll be done, and we can, I can hand the floor over uh, to counsel. But um, remember this, too. And now we're starting the jury trial process. Right? We've done the jury selection process. Um, during the course of this case, there will be times when you might see one of the lawyers in the morning on the elevator coming up, because remember we're on the 16th floor, where you could see him in passing downstairs or going to Capriati's or lunchtime across the street. I know you understand this, but I just want to remind you. Uh, the lawyers involved in this case are actually um, very nice people. Yeah. They're professionals, and they're learning, and they're sick. They're uh, they've been practicing law for a long time, very seasoned. And uh, as a result, they understand the ethical obligations, um, and they can't do anything that can be construed as any on any level that would have some sort of impact on your decision. Right? They can't talk to you. They just can't. Right? Um, and they can't do anything. 
outside of what happens from an evidentiary perspective, opening statement, closing statements. I mean, they can do that in court, but they can't do anything out of it. Everybody understand? And so, if you have an invert, inadvertent contact with the lawyers, and or some of the witnesses, or part of the litigation team, or even the parties, because they'll be coming in and out, they promise not to hold that against them. Right? You can't. And this is how that works. You might see one of the lawyers, and, they, and you might say good morning on the elevator, and they don't respond. You know? Um, hopefully you remember, they can't respond. You understand? And if they did, I can tell you how that process works. They'll come into court and they'll say, well, Judge, you know, I had a contact with one of the panel members, and, and I got to bring in, you know, you know what I mean? So you promise me, if you have a contact with any of the litigation team, lawyers, and or witnesses, and they don't respond, you're not going to hold that against them. You promise that? Everybody understand? Raise our hand. We're not going to hold that against them, right? We can't. You know? Because after this case is done, trust me, they'll love to talk to you. I promise you that. They will. And, and if that, when that time comes, they, they'll never challenge your decision because sometimes they want to this gets your impressions because these, these are litigators. They try a lot of cases. And um, uh, there's methods to trying cases, just science. And sometimes they just want to know, well, what do you think about this witness or that witness? And there's a lot going on. But they would never challenge your decision. So uh, don't, don't ever look at it in that regard. Now, um, remember this, too. Um, even amongst yourselves, you shouldn't talk about the case until it's time to deliberate. You understand? Just don't do it. And I and trust me, it's happened time and time again. Right? It's happened. Um, um, and when we talk about anyone, that also includes members of your family. Right? All you can tell them is we're in trial. You know, my job's not done because we haven't deliberated. Everybody understand that? That's what we do. You know, when you and of course you're here, you take your job responsibilities very serious because that's what this whole process is about. Um, now, remember this, too. If someone approaches you and tries to talk to you or solicit something about the case, and that happens, the first thing you do is this. You go to the marshal. Let him know. You understand? Very important. And I don't anticipate that ever happening, but you never know. And I say this in every case. You go to the marshal. Um, also, do not read any news or stories. If you run across anything in media, social, print, television, or anything that might be in regards to this case, you can't watch it. You understand? Can't be. Can't be. And so, um, just remember this, ladies and gentlemen. What we're beginning to start will be the process of opening statements. I think uh, Mr. Kim's going to start out. And uh, we won't finish it this today, right? Mr. Kemp will come back to normal. Yeah. And what we're going to try to do, of course, and remember, I try to do this all the time. Um, and I'll ask you as far as guidance is concerned, but we always try to get done before 5 o'clock. Right? But we've been pretty good on that, right? If for whatever reason we had to go a little bit beyond, um, um, after 5, I always try to get you in and let you know what's going on. Because I think, I think it's just important to, to, as far as each step of the way, that you're well informed. Because it's like I said, if I had to change anything, it would be that, you know, members of the jury should wear a black robe just like the judge. Remember I said that? Because you're here to decide the facts. You're the judge of the facts right now. And right now, I'll say this final comment before I let Mr. Kemp take the floor. Uh, remember this, uh, during your service as a member of this jury, uh, you are part of our Nevada judiciary. You are, right? And for the purposes of this case, the most important part of our judiciary. Got it? Okay, Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? My name is Will Kim, K E M P. Uh, Eric Pepper and I and Mr. Parker represented seven plaintiffs in this case. So let me just tell you briefly what's going to happen. I'm going to be speaking for 40 to 45 minutes today because we need to get out of here, obviously. 
and then I'm probably going to finish tomorrow for the first hour, hour 10. And Mr. Parker's going to go 20, 25 minutes, which for Mr. Parker probably really means 35 or 40. <laughs> but in any event, um, after he gets done, Mr. is going to go. I don't know how long he's going to go. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen's going to go, and Mr. Robbins is going to go. And we're hoping that all gets done either shortly before noon or right after noon. And then at that time, we're going to take our lunch break, hopefully near near a regular lunch break. But we're going to take the lunch break, and then after that, we're going to have our first witness. Hopefully, that's the way it's going to go tomorrow. We might even be able to squeeze in two tomorrow. I'm not promising, but you know we're going to give it a shot. Okay, this is a case about acute liver failure. ALF. ALF means acute liver failure. You're going to hear the term acute liver failure or ALF hundreds of times in this case because that's the serious injury that these plaintiffs suffer. And before introducing you to the plaintiffs in this case, let me explain to you briefly about acute liver failure and how the acute liver failure outbreak in Clark County was discovered. Okay, Shane, can I have my first picture, please? This is where the liver is in your body. Uh, the, the spine's actually behind the liver. But that is your liver, that's your liver. You only have one liver, you don't have two. That's the liver. Shane, can I have the next one? This is a little better shot of the liver where it hooks up. And, and, and it's really not that important for this case, all these different things that are hooked up to the liver. But I'm just trying to emphasize to you where the liver is and what it looks like. Okay. So acute liver failure involves the liver. And let me give you an explanation about the liver. It's one of the most important organs of the body. It has 500 different functions. Okay. Some of the critical functions are detoxification, processing of proteins and biochemicals. You cannot live if you do not have a liver. Because one, your blood won't clot right. Two, toxins and chemicals will build up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Three, any defenses you have against infection fail immediately. And four, swelling starts, including swelling of the brain. And I'm gonna give you the big medical report in a minute. You cannot get an artificial organ or device that's capable of performing all the functions of a liver. Okay, there are no artificial livers. If you have acute liver failure and it does not resolve itself, there is only one option, and that is a liver transplant, liver transplantation. You have to get a liver from another human being, and they have to put it in you. That is the only option. All right? Now let's talk a little more about acute liver failure. Acute liver failure, it's a critical medical condition. Complete loss of liver function happens rapidly, in days or weeks. And usually, it happens in people that have no pre-existing liver disease. And you'll hear from the plaintiffs in this case, do not have pre-existing liver disease. Acute liver failure is a medical emergency. It requires hospitalization immediately. Usually, they put you in an intensive care unit. Next, please. It means just what it says, failure. The liver stops working. Your liver stops working, it rapidly fails. It causes serious complications. Extreme fatigue, jaundice, loss of motor functions, bleeding, loss of consciousness, increased pressure in the brain. These are the symptoms of acute liver failure. Over 20% of the people that have acute liver failure die. Next, Kathy Ryerson, one of the plaintiffs in this case, died of acute liver failure. Now, let me introduce you to the plaintiffs. <clears throat> there are seven plaintiffs in the case. Each and every one of the plaintiffs suffered from acute liver failure. Have the plaintiff, please, please. That's the first plaintiff, Orion Gallagher. Orion Gallagher was eight months old when he suffered acute liver failure. I'm going to get into it in a minute. Next one's Kathy Ryerson. That's Kathy on the right. She's the one that died. Next, Shane. That's James Yu. James is sitting right there. 
tell you a little more about him in a second. Next one, Shane. Jeremy Botiz. Jeremy's sitting right there. I'll tell you more about his case in a second. That's Richard Belsky. Rich is sitting right over there on the far left. I'll tell you more about him in a second. Keith Haley. Keith was here the first couple days of jury selection. He's not here today, but he'll be back. Next one, please. And that's Yvonne Arnone. Uh, she lives in Summerlin. She had, I don't want to say why she's not here, but she will be here in the next couple of days. So these are the seven plaintiffs in this case. All seven had acute liver failure. So let's start with Orion Gallagher. <clears throat> This is a picture of Ryan Gallagher when he's approximately eight months old. As you can see, he's standing by a water dispenser. Ironically, he's standing by a real water bottle in the dispenser. That was Ryan. This is Ryan. Orion, excuse me, I said Ryan, it's Orion. This is a picture of Orion in the hospital. First of all, real water promoted the product as being good and healthy for children. This is a slide, a promotional slide for real water. All bottled water companies claim, if I get this thing working, there we go. Claim their water is the best. A laser won't work on the screen, Mr. Kemp. Okay. Claim that their bottled water is the best and healthiest. However, there's three very important questions you should ask before buying your bottled water. Your personal health and the health of your children depend upon. They promoted it for children. You will hear testimony that the government authorities here in Clark County. They finally realized that real water was a serious health problem because five other young children, not a Ryan, five other young children were flown up to a Salt Lake hospital for liver transplants all in the course of a couple weeks. They didn't ultimately have liver transplants, but the doctor up in Salt Lake called down the Southern Nevada Health District and said, what is going on here? This is very unusual. You know, we should not have acute liver failure in, in children. Uh, the way they detect acute liver failure is by liver function tests. So let's talk a little bit about what those are because you're going to hear the terms ALT and AST quite a bit in this trial. First one, Shane. So you can diagnose liver disease by liver function tests. So these are blood tests. They take some blood and they run them through, I'm not really sure how they do to be honest, but they help show the extent of the liver damage. Next one please. So ALT and AST, long words, you don't want to hear them, all you need to know is ALT and AST. Those are the two most common liver function tests. And I'm going to show you some ALT and AST results for all the plaintiffs in this case. So this is normal. The normal range is 12 to 78 for ALT. 78 is at the high end, 12 is at the low end. Anything before that range, in, in between that range, is considered normal. AST, 15 to 27. So if you're between 15 and 27, that's normal. <clears throat> so if you're above 78 or... 27, that's when you have what's called abnormal liver function tests. So when you have someone with acute liver failure, as you can imagine, usually they have very high ALT or AST results. Next, please. Starting with Orion. They took Orion. They could see that there was something wrong with Orion. So they took him to Sunrise Hospital. Again, he was eight months old. He had been vomiting for three days. He had other problems that they're talking about there. And then they measured his AST and ALT. Look at those ratings. 
I just told you what normal was. He had 1542 AST, extremely high. ALT, he had 2257, very high. So Sunrise immediately sent Orion to Salt Lake City for a liver transplant. And Orion's mom is Camille Gallagher. She was here the first couple of days. She'll be back, testify, hopefully for giving the trial. So Camille carried Orion on an emergency jet flight from Las Vegas to Salt Lake City. And the reason they went to Salt Lake City is that's where the liver transplant center is for children. That's why they went to Salt Lake City. Orion's father, Brian, the next day drove the family car up from Las Vegas to Salt Lake City. So let's see how Orion, this is Orion, that's Camille. That's Orion in the hospital in Salt Lake. Next one, Shane. This is the same picture I'm showing you here. Orion in the hospital in Salt Lake. It was touch and go with Orion. And Camille is going to testify about her fears that they would lose Orion. And later on, I'm going to show you some more documents. But this picture alone shows the near-death condition that Orion was in. And I'm going to show you some more hospital records later. But this picture alone says it all. So I talked briefly about liver transplant. That is a serious operation. Okay. Liver transplant is a treatment option for end-stage liver disease. When you're at the end of the line and your liver's failing, failing they, they consider giving you a liver transplant. Or if you have acute liver failure, like the plaintiffs in this case, and it doesn't resolve itself quickly, they give you a liver transplant. Liver transplants are not easy operations to do. They're only done in a small group of U.S. transplant centers. So here in Nevada, we have to go to Utah, which is the primary children's hospital. That's where Orion went. That's also where the five children that the doctor called the health district about went. They all went to primary children's hospital. The other place you can go, California, you can either go to UCLA, USC, Stanford. Uh, I think there's also a facility in Denver. But you can only get this done in special places. Next one, please. And when they do this surgery, they have to have a highly trained transplant team. It takes between 4 to 18 hours. It's done by very specialized doctors. We're going to have one come testify, hopefully, sometime uh, next week. But he'll explain the operation to you uh, in more detail. Next, please. When you get a new liver, when they take a new liver out of someone and give it to you, that is not your liver. So you have to take what they call immunosuppressive drugs. Okay, and That just suppresses your immune system so you don't reject the new liver. You have to do those for at least a year after the transplant. Next, please. Fails 10 to 15 percent of the time. Operation fails. Even if you have a successful operation, 58 chance, only 58 percent have a chance of surviving the next 15 years. And as you would expect, some of this is dependent upon the age of the transplant recipient. Orion's a fighter. After going to Salt Lake, drinking the good hospital water, his liver function tests improved. The doctors decided not to do a liver transplant. They did not have to do a liver transplant on Orion. He was discharged sent back home here to um, Las Vegas. He's now four years old and he attends preschool in Green Valley, which Camille will tell you about. Let's talk about our next plaintiff, Kathy Ryerson. Kathy Ryerson was a retired nurse who was living in Arizona and she came into the Las Vegas area after she retired because her two sisters lived here. Uh, you've seen both of them attending uh, the trial and they're both sitting over there right now. And I'm going to introduce them in a second. Well, probably, probably tomorrow, but in any event, she drank primarily what are called five-gallon jugs. This picture I showed of Orion, this is a five-gallon jug. 
And she also drank a smaller bottle, a retail bottle, but she was drinking five gallon jugs because she got home delivery. She went to Rose de Lima Hospital two different times. The first time was three days from August 19th, 20 to August 21st, 20. Second time she went from 18 days from August 23rd, 20 to November 10th, 20. So she's in the hospital for a total of 21 days, most of the time in ICU. As I mentioned, Mrs. Ryerson died on November 11th, 2020. Next plaintiff, James Yu. James is sitting over there. James is a financial consultant who lives near Summerlin. He went to Spring Valley Hospital, and he was also in the hospital for a long time. He went to Spring Valley Hospital on November 8, 2020, and he stayed there for 13 days, 13 days. The hospital had to keep James for 13 days because his liver function readings just did not come down. And I'll show them to you in a second. Finally, they let him out of the hospital on November 21st, 2020. Next plaintiff, Jeremy Botiz. Jeremy's sitting over there in a white shirt. Jeremy went to St. Rose Hospital Martin. He was in there from October 12th to October 14th, 2020. And one of his liver function tests was off the chart. I will show it to you in a second. Rich Belsky. Rich was hospitalized at UMC on May 25th, 2018. He stayed there four days until May 29th, 2018. He also had very high liver function tests, and I'm going to show those to you. Next plaintiff is Yvonne Arnone. She was hospitalized at Southern Hills Hospital here in Las Vegas, November 2nd, 2020, for two days. <coughs> she was then airlifted to Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. I know it's UCLA, but I guess they call it Ronald Reagan now. They sent her there for a transplant evaluation. She stayed at there from she stayed there from November 2nd to November 8th. She's there for six days. She had extraordinarily high uh, ALTs and ASTs, and I'm going to show them to you in a second. <laughs> UCLA, UCLA let her out, but it was on the condition that she stay in LA, and she continued to have outpatient treatment down there for two or three weeks. So the last plaintiff Mr. Parker is going to tell you about, that's Mr. Haley. Can I have all seven of them, please? So these are the seven plaintiffs in this case. All seven plaintiffs had one thing in common. They drank real water. They all got acute liver failure. And again, acute liver failure is a very, very rare disease, especially for young people in humans. So let's start with the story about how the public health authorities figured out that real water was the probable cause of dozens of acute liver failures in Clark County. In late fall 2020, the liver doctor from Salt Lake I told you about called the Southern Nevada Health District and said something is going on down there. I have just seen five children in a row from Clark County, all with acute liver failure, all set up here by JET, all for transplants. Something is going on down there. These are the five children. They are not plaintiffs in this case. I'm just showing this to you to, to show you how the public health authorities figured out what was going on. So that's Lyric and London Williams, twins, Chris Wren, we don't have a picture of the carrier baby, and Severn Morales. These were the five children's that, children that were sent up to Salt Lake. Again, all for liver transplants. This is a slide from the Southern Nevada Health District explaining their, thought, their initial thought process. They got the reports of the hospitalized children, <clears throat> hepatitis, that just means liver failure, of unknown cause. So the, they go up to the hospital. That's where the Salt, Salt Lake is, I guess. That's what they're trying to depict. That's the hospital. So they go up there, they resolve, and they come back. 
That's how this investigation started. Next one, Shane. Young children, previously healthy, and all of a sudden, they all need liver transplants? That's, that was the, the big question the health authorities faced. Next one, please. So, the health district interviewed the families of those five children, and they said, well, where do you live? What do you eat? What have you been doing recently? And they found all five of those children had one thing in common. They all drank real water. So the health district focused the investigation on real water. Next one, Shane. So the health district, they can do a little more intense investigation than you and I can. So they actually have access to all the hospital computers in the valley. So someone at the, the Southern Valley Health District, they can get on their computers at the health district and they can pull up medical records all throughout the valley, every single hospital. So what they did is, we're investigating cases of acute liver failure. So let's look and see how many cases of acute liver failure we've had that are not explained by other causes. So they did what's called a query. That just means they asked the computer to bring up data. Diagnostic codes. That just means the diagnostic code K71 for toxic liver disease and 72.9, liver failure not elsewhere classified. So they were trying to see how many people have we had in the valley. I think their time period was uh, 17 through 20. I'll show it to you in a second. But how many people have we had here in the valley in the last three or four years? that there's just no explanation for a case of acute liver failure. So here's what they found. This is a publication. It's been admitted into evidence. It's called the MMWR. It's published by the CDC and the Center for Disease Controls. And it's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. So we're going to refer to it most of the time as the MMWR. But that's the full name right there. So here is what they found. They did a graph. And they're trying to see, are there spikes, are there unusual spikes here that show how many people got acute liver failure. So you'll see the big spike in November 2020. In a second, I'm going to explain to you why there was a big spike. But you also see spikes at other time periods. So look here, in 2017 you have a spike, 2018 you have a spike, 2019 you have a spike, and you have probably two spikes here in 2020. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. They found a series of spikes, which our experts are going to tell you indicate that there was an ongoing problem. So just looking at these spikes, I told you there was a 2018 spike. One of the plaintiffs in this case, Rich Belsky, drank real water in 2018 and had acute liver failure. I told you there was a 2019 spike. That was when Keith Haley drank real water and had acute liver failure, and also Ryan Gallagher, okay? The 2020 spike, the big spike, four of the plaintiffs in this case, including Kathy Ryerson, are in the big spike. And we're going to discuss exactly why the big spike occurred. We know what batch was made. We know what they did that day. We're going to have the testimony of the people who did it. But just remember for now that there is a big spike in the fall of 2020. And the four people that are in 2020, that's Mrs. Arnone. Mrs. Ryerson, again, the woman who died, uh, Mr. Botiz, and Mr. Yu. They're all in the big spike, okay? All right. So let's take a look at another chart. Again, Southern Nevada Health District is trying to figure out what's going on here. And I've got to give them credit. This was at the height of COVID, and they're still trying to figure out what's going on here. This is their, their, their list of potential causes. And you see one thing on here, one substance on here, hydrazine. H-Y-D-R-A-Z-I-N-E. Hydrazine. That was on the initial 
list of suspects. So let's focus on hydrazine. First off, this is a slide of a mythical monster called the Hydra, H-Y-D-R-A. This was the Hydra. The Hydra had, I believe, nine heads, and the, the, if you sliced one off, two more grew to take its place. So this was the Hydra. Next one, Shane, please. And just so you're not worried about a Hydra being out there, Hercules slays the Hydra in, in Greek mythology. So, so not to worry about the Hydra, but the reason I bring up Hydra is Hydrazine is not a monster, but it has monstrous consequences on the liver. And let me explain to you what hydrazine is and what it's used for. <clears throat> hydrazine is a rocket fuel. This is a picture of, what I believe, an Apollo mission that was launched from Cape Canaveral, sent the astronauts to the moon in 1969. A blend of hydrazine was used as the rocket fuel for this rocket launch. Next one, please, Shane. This is a SpaceX rocket that Elon Musk sends up quite frequently. They use hydrazine to launch up, launch these SpaceX, SpaceX rockets. Even today, I think they launched one, I think there's a launch this week or tomorrow. But anyway, they are using hydrazine as a rocket fuel right now. See these people on the right? These are rocket attendants. They've got gas masks on, protective equipment. Why? Because hydrazine is toxic. They don't want to be exposed to hydrazine. They don't want to uh, break hydrazine. It's toxic, so they put those hazmats on. It's highly toxic. And it's going to be undisputed in this case that if you drink a small amount of hydrazine, that will give you acute liver failure. And the United States government because hydrazine is such a commonly used rocket fuel, they did extensive testing on hydrazine toxicity. They fed it to monkeys, studied the extreme damage that it did to monkeys' livers. They fed it to rats, studied the extreme damage it did to rats' livers. They gave it to mice, studied the same thing. They gave it to guinea pigs, they gave it to dogs. And when we put our toxicologist witness on, he's gonna go through those studies quickly with you, I don't think this is going to be a really hotly disputed point, but we just want to establish. Can I have the next one, Shane? This is this is our toxicologist. Okay, what is a toxicologist? That's a scientist that studies the reactions of toxins on the human body. So this is Dr. Michael Cosnett. He's from the Colorado area. He's a board-certified toxicologist. He's going to discuss the scientific literature on hydrazine toxicity, and a lot of it, like I already said, comes from the government. He's going to testify that hydrazine causes acute liver failure if it's consumed by human beings. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering what this toxic rocket fuel, hydrazine, has to do with this case where seven people drank bottled water. And real water was available everywhere in Clark County. It was sold at Costco. It was sold at Whole Foods. It was sold at Terrible Herbs. As I said before, they even had direct deliveries where they took it, they delivered it right to your home. So what does the rocket fuel hydrazine have to do with this real water that was sold throughout Clark County? Remember during the jury selection, Mr. Parker, told you that we would prove that something reprehensible happened? Remember him, remember him saying that? We will prove to you that the bottled water product, known as real water, contained hydrazine. The rocket fuel hydrazine was in real water. And that was the toxin in the real water that caused the acute failure. Now, in the United States, you have a number of governmental agencies that study the potential uh, potential disease outbreaks. Okay, one is the Center for Disease Control, that's the CDC. 
So they investigate disease control outbreaks. Another one is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. They're an agency of the United States government that actually regulates food and drugs. And then another one that I've already mentioned is the Southern Nevada Health District. That's the agency here in Clark County that investigates food and water problems. Because these acute liver failures in Clark County were so serious, these three agencies pooled their resources and conducted a joint investigation. So I'm going to tell you some of the conclusions. Some of them will come from the CDC. Some will be from Southern Nevada Health District. But I'm just trying to explain why some people did some things and other people did other things. They were working together. OK, next one, please. So I'm going to tell you in a little bit what concentrate is. Concentrate, C-O-N-C-E-N-T-R-A-T-E, -E, was a special formula that real water made. And that was the secret to real water. That, that was the secret sauce that you'll hear me refer to. So the FDA went to the real water facility in Henderson in, uh, I believe, March of 2021. And they took three different samples of the concentrate. So they took the samples of the concentrate. They sent them back to the FDA lab in Cincinnati, which is where they do this kind of testing because it's not easy to test for hydrazine. And so they give you the concentrations of it that they found. 1.44 in the first sample, 1.75 in the next sample. Next one, Shane. 1.33 in the third sample. Dr. Cosnet, the toxicologist, is going to explain to you what that means. Right? But they found a hydrazine in each, in every one of the concentrate samples that they tested. And again, hydrazine was on the suspected cause list from the very beginning. That's the Southern Bad Health District chart of potential causes. Uh, but hydrazine was on there from the very beginning. So they tested the concentrate. <clears throat> and every one of the experts that testifies in this case, whether they're an expert for plaintiff side or whether they're an expert for defensive side, they will tell you that hydrazine should not be in bottled water. Not one drop should be in bottled water. There's no dispute about that. Okay, and I think all the experts are going to agree that hydrazine causes acute liver failure. I don't think there's going to be any dispute about that. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to call a liver transplant specialist to testify. His name is Dr. Hudson. This, or excuse me, that's, that's Dr. Goldsmith. His name is Dr. Hudson, and he's going to tell you that hydrazine was the cause of the acute liver failure of seven plaintiffs in this case. Now, I just said that this wasn't really in dispute. Why did I say that? Because let me talk about one of the experts hired by Real Water. Okay, Shane. By the way, that's uh, Shane. So when I say Shane this and Shane that, I'm talking about Shane back there. All right. So David Goldsmith, he's an epidemiologist. They hired him. Okay. I didn't hire this guy. Mr. Odu hired him. So he studied this, and an <coughs> epidemiologist is a scientist who studies outbreaks of injury, and he tries to figure out, oh, what, what is causing all these people to get acute liver failure? So he studied this case. And again, they hired him. I didn't hire him. He's going to tell you that the FDA found hydrazine in the concentrate. I just showed you that. Okay? He's going to confirm that. The concentrate was used to make the water. He's going to tell you, that, again, this is their expert. This isn't my expert. He's going to tell you that hydrazine is used as a rocket fuel. Next. He's going to testify that drinking hydrazine causes acute liver failure. Next. He's going to say, remember I told you that they have both five-gallon bottles and the smaller retail bottles? He's going to tell you that they found it in both of them. And I'm going to talk about the retail bottle testing in a second. 
And he's going to tell you his opinion that hydrazine was the general cause of the acute liver failure outbreak as defined by the Southern Nevada Health Okay? And again, this is their expert. This is my expert. And that's why I say there's not a lot of disagreement uh, as to what caused the injuries in this case. So let me talk about a more complicated subject. And again, remember I mentioned retail bottle test results? Okay? Before I show you those, I want to explain a concept known as degradation. So hydrazine is not in a stable state. As you can imagine, you saw the pictures of those rockets, you see the off-gassing going on. Hydrazine is not a stable uh, substance. Some substances are stable, like glass, for example. You know, if you have a piece of glass, it's the same today, tomorrow, next month. It's exactly the same. It's stable. Hydrazine is not stable. It degrades. And what do I mean by degrade? Our experts are going to explain that degrade means that if we had a real water bottle, for example, at one point in time, and we waited six months, and we measured it the first time and the second time, there'd be less hydrazine in it the second time because the hydrazine is degrading. Okay? And I'm trying to explain this concept to try to put in context some of these test results you're going to hear about. So there's three different time periods, all right? First time period, now that, that's what's called a teaser. You see the picture on the bottom? So I'm, I'm teasing you something, something coming up here that we're going to show you in a minute. So the first date that's important is the date the real water is first made, all right? So when the real water is first made, how much hydrazine is in it? No one has the precise answer to that question because real water was not testing the product for hydrazine. Okay. So no one knows exactly how much was in there. Our experts are going to give you an estimate. But, you know, obviously the plaintiffs are not testing it before they drink it. So no one knows this, this exact answer. So the second one, please, Shane. So we do know this, okay? When the FDA did the concentrate test, remember the concentrate tests were done in October of 2021. The concentrate they made was probably in existence for nine months at the time they did the test. So there's going to be some degradation between point one and point two. Okay, let's go to point three. This is the date that Eurofins tested the retail bottles. Okay, Eurofins is a private test laboratory. It's not the FDA, but they're good. They're a very good test laboratory. Uh, so. A number of retail bottles were sent to them for testing. They tested seven different retail bottles. Five of them, well, six of them actually, they found objective evidence of hydrazine in them, and they couldn't exclude hydrazine in the, six, in the seventh bottle. So basically, they found hydrazine in all three bottles. So these are the three, three dates. The date the real water was first made, the date the FDA did the concentrate test, and the date of the retail bottle testing. Next one, please, Shane. So I'm trying to explain the concept of degradation, lessening an amount, you know, wasting away, deteriorating, different words for degradation. You know, there's more here, now there's less. All right, next one, Shane. So I'm going to show you the classic example of degradation. When a substance mixes with water, this is the classic example that's used by a lot of the toxicologists as to degradation. And again, we're just trying to explain that when you mix a substance with water, it lessens over time. Okay, can, I, can you play that for me, Shane? that because that's one of the judges in the movies. But <laughs> no, I like the movie too. So next one, Shane. So full hydrazine. This is before the Wicked Witch is hit with water. So this is the amount of hydrazine at the time the product was made. 
partial degradation. <clears throat> this is the time of the FDA testing. So before the witch gets hit with the water, she probably weighs, what, 120 pounds? She gets hit with the water, degrades 30%, 25, 30 pounds maybe, and then near complete degradation. Witch is basically gone, you just see the wisps, the, the faint hints of hydrazine. So three different time periods. The first one, we will have an expert, and his name is Dr. Najem. Dr. Najem is I, I think the defense agree with this. He's the world's leading authority on hydrazine with regards to uh, water bottle. And he's going to tell you, in his opinion, the first time period when they made the bottles, hydrazine could have been up to 10 times as much as the FDA concentrate test. All right? No one knows for sure. He's just going to give you his best opinion. Because, again, no one tested it. Real water didn't test it. The plaintiffs didn't test it. So that's, that is the first time period. Next one, Jim. Okay, this is the partial degradation. This is the FDA test. I've showed you the results. I'm showing to you again. 144, 175, 133. Dr. Kosnett, the toxicologist, is going to explain to you what this means. Okay, what does it mean when you have this much hydrazine in the concentrate? Okay. Dr. Kosnett is going to explain that. Third time period, okay? near complete degradation, which is almost gone. You still see the wisps. So the Eurofins people, they tested the retail bottles. And what they find, this is their test thing. This bottle, you see that it's March 1st, 2021. Okay? That's the most recent one we could find. They find 300, it's a UG slash L, which, you know, I, it's like high school calculus. Sometimes I can get it, sometimes I can't. So I'm gonna leave it for Dr. Cosmet, all right? All right. So those are the three time periods, and that's the concept we're trying to explain, degradation. <clears throat> now, I showed you, me, let's talk a little bit about real water. Okay. These are the five-gallon jugs. Same picture here. Uh, do we have some pictures of Lincoln in the show? We got Whole Foods picture, perhaps. Yeah, okay. There, there's a. I can't tell if that's a one and a half or one liter bottle. They made it in three different sizes: one and a half liters, one liter. Half liter, uh, buy whatever you want to. Next shape. So this is Gallagher again. This is the same picture I've got here. There's a five gallon uh, jug. Next one. So this is a Whole Foods display. So like I already said, it was in Whole Foods. It was in Costco. Pretty much every gas station in town had it. You know, they were using the UFC as a vehicle for, to promote sales for a while. But this, oh, okay. See, sometimes I miss it. No, I'm supposed to do. So this is, this is a uh, retail bottle. You can see by the distinctive blue coloring, that was their big thing. It was a blue bottle. And this is one of the, I don't know if I want to try to pick that up or not. Okay, this is one of the five-gallon bottles. But this is real water. And the reason we show you the Whole Foods pictures is two of the plaintiffs in the case, Rich over there, Mr. Belsky, and Keith Haley, they bought the water at Whole Foods. That's where they got their water that they got accumulated. Whole Foods. Okay. Now, there was a four step process to make real water. And this is going to be complicated, so don't, don't be upset that I can't explain it properly the first time, all right? Because Dr. Najib is going to explain it to you. You're going to have a number of witnesses that actually work for real water that's going to explain it to you. I'm just doing the first stab here to try and get you to understand the basic process. All right, first, first step. They take purified water. Now, what's purified water? 
They just took water from the lake, and they ran a few through a purification machine, and they got purified water. So they electrolyzed it. They shot electricity in it. Step one, and I'm going to use this chart here in a second and go through it in a little more detail, but I'm just trying to get the first four steps. So they, electro, they <clears throat> electrolyze purified water, and they separate the alkaline from the acidic. All right, so they try to get the alkaline to go over here, the acidic to go over here. They keep the alkaline, and then they do the second step. They juice it again, electrolyze it again. So they're supercharging the water, and they're keeping the alkaline, the negatively charged. All right, so two first steps, electrolyze, electrolyze, and then the third step is they mix it. They take the water, the first two steps make the concentrate. Remember I told you I was going to tell you what concentrate was? This is the first two steps to make the concentrate, and we're going to go through it again on Dr. Nazim's chart here, which will be an exhibit, I hope. Um, so juice it, juice it, and after step two, we have what's called concentrate. Now they have to mix the concentrate with more purified water to make the final product, five-gallon jugs. So they start mixing it. Here's where the ORP meter comes in. And we're going to talk a lot about ORP meters, but this is the stage of the process the ORP meter comes in. This is an ORP meter, and I'm going to tell you in the next segment what an ORP meter is. So for now, just, just understand that it's a testing instrument. So they use the ORP meter to measure negative ORP, okay? Negative. They want alkaline water. Alkaline means negative. Right? So they use the ORP meter to measure negative ORP, and if the negative ORP is too low, if it's, not, if it's not high enough for them, their target was negative 225, you'll see, they would dump more concentrate in them. Okay? The concentrate, they made in steps one and two. So the meter measurement here was the trigger for whether or not you put more concentrate in. And because the concentrate had the rocket fuel, hydrazine in it, if you put more concentrate in, you added more rocket fuel to that batch. Okay? So, juice it, juice it, mix it, and use the ORP meter to decide whether you're putting in more concentrate. Juice it, juice it, get the supercharged concentrate. That was like negative 550 was their target. So juice it, juice it, mix it, and then use the ORP meter to decide whether or not you have to add more concentrate. And again, the concentrate is what um, contained the hydrogen. Now, let's move over to Dr. Nash. This is a chart that you prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you this was complicated, okay? It took all the lawyers in the case years to figure this out. In fact, I think some of the lawyers on our side, I'm not criticizing anyone over there, some of the lawyers might still be figuring this out. This is complicated stuff, okay? We're just trying to simplify it. So let's use Dr. Nod, Nod, Nodjum's chart and get into a little more detail. So they started with 300 gallons of purified water, okay? So they, they took municipal water from the lake, they ran it through the purification machine, and they got purified water. So they dumped it into these titanium tubes. You see this tube right here? Do I have a titanium tube somewhere? Here? Yeah, in the back. Well, can you give me a titanium tube while I go through this? This is a picture of the titanium tubes. Okay? This is a key component of the process because Dr. Najin is going to explain to you that this is where the hydrazine is introduced. This is where the rocket fuel comes from. Okay, so what are they doing here? They are taking the titanium tube and they are dropping the purified water through it. See on the top, they drop the purified water through it. Now they juice it. You see there's, there's places to attach things on each side of the tube. They're attaching clamps. So they're giving it electricity, and they're trying to supercharge the water, and they want the alkaline to separate into one container. This is the supercharger they use, just like a battery jumper, if you've ever used one of those. So they, they took this. Th this is the actual one. This is a picture of the actual one that was at the real water. So they hooked this up to the titanium tube, 
It wasn't just one shot. It was continuous voltage while they ran the water through the tube. So the water runs through the tube, and they set, and there, there's a picture of the, the tube holding device. Because, and here's one of the two, well, here's two of the tubes, actually. Okay, I don't think I'm going to break them because they're made out of titanium. But these will be in evidence. You'll be able to look at them and touch them. Okay? Don't look at your the tubes going by. Okay? <laughs> so the tubes, they, they put the tube on this holder here. So there's the tube in the process. And they hook the electricity up through it. And then they run water just by gravity from the top, comes out the bottom. All right? Inside the tube's what's called a diaphragm. That just means a, uh, a barrier that separates the water into acidic and alkaline. All right? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make alkaline water. So they drop the water through the tube. And remember, remember I said half of it is alkaline and half of it is acidic? So when you take 300 gallons and you throw away the positive water, you throw away 150 gallons, you're left with 154, 150 gallons. So you start with 300, subdivide once, you get 150. Now they run it through again because they want to supercharge it. So they're starting out with 150 this time, all right? So they dump 150 through the tubes, half of it goes away, half of it they keep. So they start with 300, go through the process twice, they have 75 gallons left of alkaline water, and the rating is supposed to be negative uh, 550. Now this was a top secret process. Only one person in real water knew how to do it. Okay? This was not something the regular workers in real water did. They had a special concentrate room where the secret sauce was made because this was considered their big secret, you know, like Coca-Cola's formula. This was the big thing that made real water work, so only one person could know about it. So they had the secret concentrate room. Now, they make the concentrate. Now we go, that's step one, 300, 150, 150, 75. Juice it, juice it. Now we got to mix it, right? So now we mix it. We take the uh, 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 concentrate and we throw it in with uh, 100 gallons of, I think you take five gallons of concentrate and 105 or five and 100, I can't remember which one. But anyway, that's how they make the final product. Then they mix it together and that's where the ore meter comes in. They test it to see if it's negative 225. If it's under negative 225, not, not alkaline enough, okay? If it's a negative 130, negative 120, it is not alkaline enough for, for what they're trying to do. So that's when they add the additional concentrate in. And again, that's why the ORP meter is an important part of this process, because the ORP meter is the sole determinant, the sole indicator of, why, of whether or not to add more concentrate in, and the concentrate had the rocket fuel. So that's how the ore meter fits into this. Four fifty one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think I've, I've we'll pick up on this in the morning. So, judge it, ready to break. Yeah, it's it's a good time. Okay, all right. Right, so you ready? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know what we're going to try to do throughout the whole course of the process of this trial. We'll get you in the room, like you're out of here at four or five o'clock. The reason for it is you need to have a predictable day, right? Yeah, so anyway, um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to recess for the evening. We're going to meet tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We'll have a full day, but we want to get a lot of accomplished tonight. And so anyway, uh, and what we'll do tomorrow, I anticipate, we'll hear opening statements from everyone in the this case. And then hopefully in the afternoon, we'll hear some, some witness testimony. <coughs>
And so remember this. You're admonished not to converse amongst yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected to the trial. Or to read, watch, or listen to any report of our commentary on the trial by the persons connected with this case. By any medium of information, including without limitations, newspaper, television, radio, uh, remember the social media prohibition. <coughs> but last but not least, do not form or express any opinion on any subject connected with the trial to the cause of violence in the future. Uh, lastly, just remember, when you come up the elevator, if you run into one of the lawyers and or uh, uh, witnesses or one of the parties to this case, you can't talk. You understand? And so even if you forget and you say good morning, they're not going to respond. You understand? Okay. So in light of that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. And I'm glad to And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. All right, Sid Parks, your jury.
Yes, it's kind of unique because you do have a huge challenge. So, I guess we literally have to order the witnesses not to watch you. This is the first for me. Or just advise them not to watch the trial online. No. I mean, okay. it it no, no, you can't still watch that. We'll talk about it later. Your Honor, I believe that Mr. Capri is on a witness list, but he's not a representative. Are we invoking that will? I'm just state. making sure that we don't have an argument. Something you're going to try to do with later. Get one. Right here. Get one. There's no rules. Get one.